today we're talking about mental health and well-being. And so I want to just help to distinguish these terms. The terms mental health and emotional health aren't interchangeable. While they're while they are connected, they have very different meanings. Understanding those differences is not an exercise in semantics. It's essential information for all of our well-being. So I want to envision mental health as the ocean with emotional health being the waves. With that comparison in mind, let's consider the differences. Mental health involves processing all of the information that we encounter, while emotional health is more about the feelings provoked by the data that we use. Emotional and mental health are related, but they are different. Everyone feels anxious at times, but anxiety is a diagnosable mood disorder. People feel sad or depressed after a setback, but depression is another diagnosable mood disorder. In psychotherapy, words have precise meanings, and these meanings are essential for effective treatment. To cope with life and relationships well, we must balance our thoughts and our emotions. If one is out of sorts, the other will also be impacted. So mental health or well-being is about the functioning of our brain and how we process incoming data. It's the hardware and involves emotional health in addition to our intellectual, spiritual, and social health. Emotional well-being is a software that blends emotional intelligence with emotional regulation. In this slide, what we're seeing are the high prevalence rates of mood disorders in people with MS compared to the general population. So people with MS are in blue and the general population is in orange. And what we see is that depression is about three to four times as likely in people with MS than in the general population with anxiety disorders, adjustment disorders, bipolar disorder, and psychotic disorder, disorders also being very high. Emotional well-being is your body's software and is an important component of overall mental health and wellness. In addition to affecting how we perceive ourselves and the world around us, emotions influence how we feel physically our motivation to attend to our health, how much and what we eat, the amount we exercise, how much we sleep, how you relate to other people in the larger world, and how intensely and joyfully you engage in your chosen roles. Clearly, the mind and the body are closely tied. And let me demonstrate that now. To understand how strongly tied the, the mind and the body are, I want to do a little experiment with you. Of course, I'm a psychologist, so I love doing experiments. So I want you to imagine that before coming here today, I went to the corner market and grabbed some lemons, a cutting board and a knife. I am slicing the lemons. I'm doing that right in front of you. And the lemons are so ripe that the juice is oozing off of my hands. I hand you each a piece of the lemon and I ask you to put it in your mouth. Bite down. What's happening in your mouth, in your body? Keep track of any sensations and physiological reactions. Now, if you're like me, you come home in the evenings and find Amazon packages or Target boxes or whatever it is stacked outside of your door. You bring the boxes inside of the house and you open the boxes and many of them may have styrofoam inside of them. I want you to take your fingers into the styrofoam and I want you to notice that squeaky sound. Notice what's happening in your body. Finally, and maybe the worst, is imagine that I have a chalkboard right behind me and imagine that I have long fingernails, which I don't, <laughs> but imagine that I have them and I run my fingernails down that chalkboard. Pay attention to what's happening in your body. Ugh. In all of these examples, you're likely physiologically responding to something that is not in front of you. You're not in the same room as me and you're likely not even in the same state as me. Your body is responding to the memory of that object. You see, our body responds to emotion, memory, feelings, and this exercise should show you how closely the mind and the body are tied. It also tells us that our minds are, are able to respond and develop using strategies that help us grow our mental and emotional well-being, even in the face of challenges and change. Resilience is important in people living with chronic diseases like MS, and actually for all of us, myself included. In life, stress happens. Chances are, at some point in your life, someone told you that adversity builds character. That may seem like odd or cold comfort when you're going through a very difficult experience, but it turns out that the saying is actually true. 
Researchers have found that people who experience a moderate amount of hardship throughout their lives show greater overall well-being and resilience. These people have learned that practicing behaviors that promote resilience is the secret to not just coping with the disease, but to thriving with it. But what is resilience exactly? I get asked that a lot. How do you build resilience? Resilience is commonly described as the ability to bounce back from difficult circumstances, to find happiness and life satisfaction despite challenges. When people are resilient, they still experience difficult feelings such as anger, frustration, grief, and sadness. A significant part of resiliency involves what researchers call positive adaptation or realistic optimism. This is remaining hopeful about the future despite difficult situations. In this slide, let's talk about nature versus nurture. Some people may seem to be more naturally resilient to others, almost as if they're born with that trait for resilience and others just aren't so lucky. I have this conversation frequently with my mother. What makes someone resilient and what makes someone less resilient? To a large degree, resilience is determined by how an individual perceives and responds to stressful and negative events. Those who see it as a challenge or a problem to be solved tend to be more naturally resilient. Those who see it as a threat may respond by retreating or avoiding and therefore demonstrating less resilience. Researchers have found that everyone has a different set point for resilience that is determined partly by genetics and partly by early environmental circumstances. Together, these factors make up about half of one's capacity to adapt positively to significant challenges, but the other half of resilience comes from learning and using a set of cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal skills. Humans have a pre-programmed biochemical response to stress, commonly known as the fight or flight. We talk about this a lot in my practice. In prehistoric days, when a human encountered a saber-toothed tiger, tiger, let's say, they had two options, kill the tiger or run like mad. And most of us know that humans are not good at killing tigers. To be successful for, with either of these options, the human body would respond by secreting a variety of hormones and other chemicals. Among these is cortisol, sometimes known as the stress hormone, and I'm sure that you've heard of this. The release of cortisol and other biochemicals would temporarily turn off some biological functions and focus all of a person's energy and resources on survival. In modern times, our saber-toothed tiger comes in the form of chronic illness, job stress, financial difficulties, even driving in rush hour traffic. As a result, many of us ramp up production of cortisol with other stress-related biochemicals as we deal with our daily ongoing difficulties. When these high levels of cortisol are sustained in our bodies over time, we become more susceptible to anxiety, depression, obesity, heart disease, and a whole other host of health problems. This chart depicts how different our bodies react in times of rest versus challenge. Researchers have identified specific genes that dictate how intensely our bodies respond to stress, and this contributes to our set point for resilience. But genetics doesn't tell the whole story. Environmental factors play a role too. Exposure to a series of manageable stressors early in life helps children develop lifelong skills that contribute to resilience. Examples of stressors include having to say goodbye to a parent when being dropped off at preschool, working through disagreement with peers, or sustaining minor injuries during a game that you love to play. In this context, children are likely to develop skills they can rely on throughout their lives to help them thrive under challenging situations. Some of these skills include adaptation, ability to tolerate strong negative emotions, asking questions to understand, or a tendency to seek out new challenges. Combined with genetics, these traits are considered the stable factors that create a person's natural set points of resiliency. However, those only make up about half of resiliency in humans. The other half comes from learned and practiced behaviors. Research shows us that people with high levels of resilience have better long-term physical and psychological health. They have lower risks of heart disease and get infections less often. They are less likely to experience depression and anxiety. And what's more is that resilient people tend to have healthier relationships with others, as well as greater self-esteem, self-confidence, and also find that new life opportunities arise as the result of these improvements. There are three strategies that people typically work through on the road to developing greater resilience. 
Number one is understanding. People in this stage invest their time and energy in learning as much as they can about the situation that they are facing. Example, people newly diagnosed with MS might begin learning about the symptoms of the disease and get started to get connected with other people in the MS community. They may choose their physicians. They may look at the drugs that they're interested in in, uh, starting. Two is managing. People in this stage begin to learn new coping strategies and lifestyle behaviors. For example, they learn how to best care for themselves and start to try different methods for managing stressors and the unpredictability that comes with MS. And the third stage is growth. People in this stage may start to experience shifts in their priorities and begin to feel a sense of gratitude for the positive things in their lives. That's my favorite one. Sometimes even the most resilient people struggle with their mood. The practice of resilience is just one strategy, but what about managing emotional changes that challenge your mood? MS can have a significant impact on a person's mood, not only because MS is challenging to live with, which it is, but because it affects parts of the brain that control mood. Mood changes are a symptom of MS as well as a reaction to MS. Mood reflects the way a person is feeling emotionally at any given time. Mood changes with MS include grief, worry, or fear and our natural reactions to challenges that come with the MS diagnosis. It's important to recognize and talk to your healthcare provider if mood challenges become too severe that they lead to a mood disorder. Depression is one of the most common symptoms of MS, but also one of the most effectively treated. There is hope for that feeling. MS can also cause significant anxiety because of the uncertainty and unpredictability associated with MS. Moodiness and irritability may manifest as rapid and unpredictable changes in emotion. The increase in moodiness can have multiple causes stemming from untreated depression or changes in your brain from MS disease progression. MS can also experience the expression of emotions as well. Pseudobulbar effect, or PBA, is uncontrollable episodes of laughing and crying that is experienced by about 10% of people with MS. Behavioral medicine is a field that applies behavioral theories to the treatment of psychological disorders. It's the field that I specialize in. This study was conducted actually in my clinic, where we looked at 505 patient records from from 2010 to 2015. Patients with less than three therapy sessions were excluded. Our outcomes were reduction in anxiety and depression between the first and the last session, We found statistically significant reduction in depression in those who participated in at least three sessions. Participation in additional sessions, greater than 10, um, resulted in improved reduction in depression and anxiety. This study is exciting because it shows us that short-term treatment with a psychologist is beneficial for people with MS emotional well-being. So when we think about managing mood disorders, the bottom line is a correct diagnosis of emotional emotional changes and mood disorders is essential in order to identify the right treatment. The most effective therapy is actually combination therapy, including both an antidepressant and professional counseling and group changes. Mood changes are not a sign of weakness. In fact, dealing with them is a sign of strength, in my opinion. Emotional changes and mood disorders with MS should be addressed like physical symptoms are. Mood changes can be a symptom of MS as well as a reaction to the to the challenges and to the disease. I suggest reporting changes to your healthcare team. Ask your healthcare professional if there is an MS navigator for a referral to a mental health professional who understands MS. I also think it's important to connect with others in person or online for support. Mood disorders are highly treatable when properly addressed and will likely involve a blend of counseling, such as talk therapy, medication if needed, and exercise. Stress can have major impacts on the body. And I think what this slide shows us is that learning to eliminate unnecessary stressors and then again, managing the ones that are here to stay is essential for overall mental and physical well-being. The effects of stress on the body are all over, right? So this depiction shows us how impactful stress is on the body in almost every major organ system, from the brain to the heart, to the immune system, to the gut, to the sexual systems, bones, and joints. Stress impacts the entire body. So when we think about MS, from its earliest conception, Charcot, who is known as the father of MS, described the impact of stress in his first depiction of MS. 
Since then, there have been several class three studies that are observational or self-reports that show us that MS and stress are closely tied. These reports show us observational and correlational data that it's probably a relationship between stress and MS, but we aren't sure because people were not randomized into different control groups. For example, there are reports that show us that people that were involved in the Lebanese war and another report showing us that individuals who came back from Vietnam wars um, had increased prevalence of MS. However, until 2012, there was not a class one study or a randomized control study that shows us the link between stress and MS. I'm now going to describe some research by David Moore and his colleagues that much of my practice was built off of. So let's look at Moore's study. Moore, he looked at 121 people who were randomly assigned to treatment or control group over a six-month period. In the treatment group, subjects were taught 16 individual sessions that taught stress management techniques over a 24-week period. The measures that he used were MRI, GAD, and T2 brain lesions. Results showed us that those in the treatment group or the stress management group had decreases in brain lesion. In fact, 77% had fewer GAD enhancing lesions compared to 55% in the control group. And 70% were free of T2 lesions compared to 43% in the control group. It was important to note though, that after the study had concluded, people were not actively engaged in stress management and therefore they developed new brain lesions. This shows us how important it is to actively engage in stress management throughout a person's life. So as we conclude today, I wanted to show you if this actually works. So again, I love experiments being the psychologist, researcher, scientist that I am. And if you're willing, I want you to get in a comfortable position and we're just going to breathe for the next minute. While you're doing this, I want you to count your breath. So I'm going to time you for the next minute. And all I'm going to ask you to do is breathe. So let me get my timer out and go ahead and breathe. And count your breaths. Okay, stop. I want you to hold on to that number in your head. And first, I want you to just think in your head. And I wish that we were actively engaged in person so that I could hear your responses. But what did that minute feel like? Did it feel like an eternity? Were you able to focus on the breathing? Were you thinking about what you had to do next? Were you here in person? You know, we call that mindful. Or did it really feel relaxing? Um, next, what I want you to do is I want you to get that number in your head. And we'll go on to the next slide. So I have probably some good news and some bad news. And I would assume that most of you had breaths per minute that were greater than 12 breaths per minute. And what I'm afraid to tell you is that breathing more than the medical norm at rest, which is greater than 12 breaths per minute, is, considering, is considered psychological hyperventilation. The average person breathes about two times the norm, causing lower brain oxygen levels. Hyperventilation reduces oxygen delivery to all vital organs in the human body. So next, I'm going to teach you a skill of diaphragmatic breathing. And if I were here with you in person, I could show you the exact placement that I would like for your hands to be in, but I'm going to have to describe it since you can't see my body. So I'd like for you to put one hand on your chest and one hand under your diaphragm. So look at that um, green uh, kind of U shape under the, the ribs. That's where I'd like for you to place your hand. So diaphragmatic breathing has a lot of benefits. It improves the venous return to the heart, leads to improved stamina in both disease and athletic activity. It expands the lungs' air pockets, improving the flow of blood and lymph. It helps prevent infection, and it increases oxygenation in the body. But for our purposes, it's an excellent tool to stimulate the relaxation response that results in less tension and overall sense of well-being. 
So I want you to see if you're breathing from your chest or if you're able to pull that breath into your diaphragm. And my goal for you is the diaphragmatic breath. And now we're going to end today by us practicing what I call circular three breathing. So let's take that diaphragmatic breath one step further into serial three or circular breathing. In this exercise, we learn that the breath is a continuous circle. And we also learn how to use the hold to slow us down and shut down the sympathetic nervous system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the cycle. So it starts with the inhale and we inhale for three seconds. We hold for three seconds, and really that's where the magic occurs is during that hold, because typically we breathe in, out, in, out, and we don't take time to pause, but that hold really helps us to move into that parasympathetic rest, relax um, state and shutting down that sympathetic nervous system. And then we're going to exhale for three seconds. So again, I'm going to time you for that one minute again. And in this minute, what I want you to do is I want you to inhale in for three seconds, hold for three seconds, and exhale out for three seconds, and see if your number decreases. So I'll walk you through the first cadence, and then I want you to to take it on your own as you have a different cadence than I do. Okay, so as we begin, we breathe in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, and go over and take it on yourself. Okay, stop. So hopefully you were able to decrease your breath per minute from wherever you were earlier to a lot fewer. Um, My goal is for you to get under six breaths per minute. Um, So I wanted to end on that today to give you a skill to take with you. And thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope that you feel more equipped to manage your emotional wellness. Thank you.